Good morning, have a beautiful Shabbat, Shabbat Para. <clears throat> now we're ready to receive the light of Pesach. We said last week that from, Rabbi Nachman teaches from Pur, which is Purim is made Para, and with the Para activated, we are now in a sense pure to a certain level to receive, even today, the spiritual aspect of the Korban Pesach. Even though there's no physical temple now, but like, it, like the rabbis teach, let our lips pay and be instead of the pari, the, the, the oxes, the bulls that are offered as sacrifice on the, te- on the temple. So instead our lips, that's the idea of speech being activated, which again is pesach, we spoke about last week. Pe means the mouth, sach is speaking and is conversing. The faculty of speech is revealed with strength and with that we can receive the holiness of the Korban Pesach, which is the sacrifice of Pesach on Passover visit Hashem. So we have all these gifts now. We have Purim, Bara, and now we're on our way visit Hashem. Just uh, some more insights. We're now trying to uh, uh, do a transition to new ideas. I'm going to do it in a transition mo- mode. So visit Hashem. Uh, just uh, one final and strong idea, which will be the end, but the introduction to the new concepts that we're going to go into with Hashem for the next uh, few weeks, with Hashem. <coughs> going back to this powerful psalm in, in Tehillim, chapter 107, which, by the way, is the psalm of Pesach. If you look in, in your art scroll, Siddur, or whatever, you see that the, the, there's psalms which are associated with festivals, and Psalm 107, which is the four who have to give thanks to Hashem, our Ba'ashat Tzichim Lehodot, is associated with the festival of Pesach. Even though the, the, the time of the, of the temple, the time of the Gemara, the time of the, of the temple, yes, that these four types of people mentioned in Psalm 107, the one who travels by the desert, the one who travels by the sea, someone who's in jail and comes out, and someone who's deathly ill and comes out, they would have to offer a Korban Toda, a Thanksgiving offering, and that offering is not offered on Pesach because it consisted of chametz. It had in it its ingredients chametz. It was offered before Pesach or after Pesach. Nevertheless, Thanksgiving, which, which this psalm represents and comes to teach us, is the psalm of, of Pesach. In it, the Gemara, Masechet Rosh Hashanah, it asks the question, does prayer always work? Can prayer help? <clears throat> in other words, can davening to Hashem help even after a decree has been made? It's a discussion in the Gemara, page 16 or page 17, one of those two pages in the Gemara Rosh Hashanah. They ask, they say that prayer, tshuva, tzedakah, they can break a harsh decree against the person, against the group of people. So they go into the details. And they first of all, they learn out, what do they learn out that prayer can break decrees? From this chapter in, in, in Tillman, this Psalm 107, where it says the four times of the four cases, Vayitz akor Hashem batzar lahem, mimetzukotehem yotziem. That and the Jews they cried out to Hashem in their tightness, batzar when it was tight for them and 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 the type of a pain and and and, and going through a difficulty, and Hashem releases them, frees them, escapes them, lifts them out, mimetzukotehem from their mitzuka, from their distress. So the Gemara learns out from this psalm that yes. Prayer works. So the Gemara goes on to ask, is it always the case? In other words, what if in heaven a decree has already been issued? Can a person with their prayer break the decree? So the Gemara says, yes. And it said, but there's an exception. There is a situation where prayer cannot work. Watch this. We know something amazing tonight. Visit this one. What is the case and where do we learn it from? The case is of an individual's prayer after a decree has been issued. It could be, the Gemara says, that sometimes they won't save a person. In other words, a group, a tzibor, a, 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 there's a rule in the, in the Gemara, in the Torah. Hen el kabir loimas. Hashem el kabir, something which is strong. In other words, a strong prayer, which is a group of people davening, a minyan, a quorum, a community. When they daven, Eloyimas, Hashem doesn't d- deny it. In other words, He answers them. When a community dav- davins to Hashem for salvation, Hashem answers them, whether it's before the decree has been issued, and even afterwards. 
but a yachid, an individual, before he, yes, it can break the decree. If the decree hasn't been sealed yet, it's before the decree in heaven, his personal prayer can work. Afterwards, it could be that it won't work. Where they learn it from? From, the, from this Psalm 107, where? If you look in the, in the actual book of Tehillim, the book of Psalms, if you look in the actual Bible, for example, you'll see in this chapter 107, when the psalmist, King David, discusses the, the situation of the scenario of the fourth person, the one who's in the storm wind, where he's going, the, 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 the sea is pushing up the ship, Ya'alu Shamayim, Yedu Te'omot, Mama, she's in danger in the storm. If you look in those verses there, regarding the fourth person, the letter Nun appears between verses backwards. The letter Nun, take a look in chapter 107, you'll see the letter, letter Nun backwards six times. So the Gemara says, aha, where else do we see in the Torah a Nun backwards? Coming up in the book of Bamidbar, in the parsha Be'alotcha, you have there, Vayi bin Soaron, Vayomer Moshe, Kuma Hashem Yafutso, Ebecha Vyadnusu Mesanecha Vipanecha. It says there, and, and, and when the Jews were, ja were sojourning, traveling in the desert, so Vayi bin, so then the, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu got indication by the clouds beginning to want to move and disperse, but they couldn't move until, Rashi brings this down explaining those verses, until Moshe Rabbeinu would say, Kumu Hashem, rise Hashem, in other words, we're about to move, we, I got the indication, but Hashem said, I want it to be through Moshe's lips. I want Moshe to give the command. Even though Hashem is giving the indication, the clouds are beginning to make a, a different shift in movement, but they didn't actually start moving so that the camps of the Jewish people in the desert would move until Moshe Rabbein would say, Kuma Hashem, rise Hashem. And it goes on, and, and you let your enemies be obliterated by Futsu Evecha. And then when Moshe Rabbein saw the indication that the clouds want to rest, and that Hashem is indicating that this is a place now that I want you, the Jewish camp, in the desert to rest. So then it's, Moshe Rabbeinu would say, Shuvah Hashem. Rest, come back, Hashem, as an indication for the clouds now to stop. So now, this tiny parsha, it's a little chapter in the parsha of Baalotcha, which consists of maybe one or two verses, has also, at the beginning and the end, the letter Nun, if you look in the actual Sefer Torah, you'll see it. The noon backwards. Between two verses, there's a letter noon like that, backwards. Rashi explains in the Chumash why, what's this noon doing here, and what's the significance of it being reverted backwards. So the noon indicates that this is not the actual place of this verse. This verse was put here purposely out of context for a different reason. Where is its actual place? The number, the, the noon, the letter noon is the numerical value of 50. 50 Parshiot, chapters, not parshas of the week, but in each parsha have smaller chapters. Fifty chapters earlier, that's the place of this chapter of Ayyub bin Soar. And why was it put here? And then, uh, that's the indication that's noon backwards to say go forwards. It's in fifty chapters ahead. That's the real place of this parsha. Why was it put here? So Rashi explains to separate between Puranut, La Frid Bena In other words, the, 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 the chapter right following after this, li this little section of Ibn Saharon talks about something negative about the Jews, that they were complaining about the manna and the quail, they didn't have enough to eat and all the things. You look at Ch and, and the Parsha Barot, there's a lot of complaining in that Parsha. And beforehand also, Rashi explains, there's also a difficulty. So to make a, like a break of something good between the two difficulties, this Parsha was put in between. So now, back to the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah. In this Psalm 107, you also have the noon backwards, not twice, six times. It's a big number here. To indicate, not necessarily that it's placed, the Gemara doesn't say that it's places earlier, but they say just like by the Chumash, Vahi bin Tsaron, it's not the actual place, it's really not to be here, it's to be omitted. We just it put here purposely in order to interrupt between not good things, not good incidents. So too, there's, a, there's something to tell us about the person who's at sea crying out to Hashem for, for help. That what? That there's some, there, there comes what's called a mi'ut, a, 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 a diminishment. What is the diminishing? The diminishment? That there are times that his prayers, the guy in the sea, won't be answered. What situation? Of an individual after the decree has been issued. So the commentaries say, well, one second, you can have a group of people on a ship. You have a quorum, 10 people. 
and they're all on the ship, and the storm struck them, they're all crying out to Hashem, that's not a minyan. So the Gemara answers, the commentaries explain, the Gemara Shah, the Ben Yishai, <coughs> they explain that when a person's in danger at sea, because of the pressure, the tension, the panic, each person doesn't pay attention to the second, they lose, they lose everything. We said in the past classes that when a person's, the, the attitude of the person in a sea storm is like a, like a drunk person, there's no brain, there's no consciousness. It says there also, the, the sea moves them like a drunkard. They have no consciousness, they're not intact. As opposed to a person in the desert, he's still aware and he's crying out to Hashem, help me before I die. The person in jail, help me. The person who's, who's dying, uh, suffering a uh, sickness, he cries out to Hashem. And even though know, the pain is unbelievable, but still more or less there's a consciousness. But when a person is hit with this panic, this trauma of the storm, there's no, there's no other person. It's only me alone and the, and the, and the, stor the, the, the storm, the sea, the water trying to swallow me up. So the Gemara says always the case of a sea storm is it's always the case of an individual prayer. It's not a group davening. It can never be. Even though there's 10 people, a quorum, a minion of people on, this, on, on deck, on the ship, there each person is crying on their own. They're not as a group. Whereas you can have a possibility of 10 people in jail. You can have a possibility 10 people in a desert to cry to Hashem. You can have a possibility of 10 people who are sick, dying, and they cry out to the daven as a group. Cry to save them. So you can have a group in other cases, but in number four of the person in the sea, it's always the case of a yachid. And the Gemara teaches from the fourth case we learn this concept that an, an individual, it could be that when he turns to Hashem, his, and it's after the decree has been sealed, Hashem won't answer his prayer. So now the question is what to do then? That means based on this, there exists a situation of God forbid, of futility, of that the, there's a dead end. That's it, it's the end of the line. There does exist a situation that Hashem puts a person in a situation and that's it, you're a dead end based on this. Based on the pshat, the simple meaning of the Gemara. Yes, after the decree, it could be, that's it. And we, we find that's a problem because by Chizkiyahu HaMelech, the Gemara, the Gemara relates, the, the Torah relates, the Tanakh, the Bible, that Yeshayahu, the prophet, was sent him to, to tell him that you're going to die now. He was deathly ill suffering from a major skin disease which was killing him, eating him away. And, um, and uh, Yeshua told him, you're being punished, you're gonna die, it's been sealed already, <clears throat> because you don't want to marry. And why don't you want to marry? Because you foresaw with your divine inspiration, your Ruach HaKodesh, Chizkiah Melech, that all your children are gonna be rotten, they're gonna fall off the path, they're gonna be wicked. And because of that, you don't, have, you don't want to get married to have kids. So that's not your cheshbon. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be married as a Jewish king, a Jewish man, and you refuse, so you're being punished, and that's it. And, and Chizkiah said, is there hope? And he said, no, it's been sealed. So Chizkiah got angry at Yeshayahu, he says, get out, leave. I have a tradition from my great, great, great ancestor, David HaMelech, that even, the Gemara says this in Bracha, that even if a sharp sword, even if a sharp sword is on a person's throat, it's about to slice his throat, he shouldn't prevent himself from Hashem's compassion, meaning there's always hope. So, resolve. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, no, there's a situation where there's no hope. And we understand from the story of Chizkiah, yes, there's hope, even in such a dire situation. What to do? What can an individual do after a decree? That's it, and haven't they sealed it? That's it, it's finished. What can I do to break that decree by changing me as a Yachid to make myself into what's called a tzibur, a group. When an individual can transform himself into a tzibur. This is an unbelievable concept. How can an individual make himself into a tzibur? There's a gift that Hashem sent in every generation. And again, we're going to bring a midrash of Rabbi Akiva. And it's amazing how the midrash brings many like examples of Rabbi Akiva when he saw his disciples were, were falling asleep in the, in the Torah lesson, so he boosted them with a wake-up call, like a teaching which was really a shaking, a shock. We spoke in the, in the past classes, Rabbi Kiva told the students of the equation between Sarah, 127 years, to Esther and Malka ruling over 127 nations. Another of these amazing teachings, these interesting teachings that Rabbi Akiva used to wake up his students once when he saw, the Mimash says, when, when he saw his students were, were falling asleep, so Rabbi Kiva said there was one woman in Egypt who gave birth to 600,000 children. 
<laughs> exactly. So when the students heard that, they said, no way, come on. <laughs> they said the same thing. That's why he told them that. So they so he answered, Yochevet, the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu, she gave birth to Moshe Rabbeinu, who's equivalent to the entire Jewish nation. He's one soul, one root soul, who's equivalent to 600,000 Jews. He earned the title. Moshe Rabbeinu was a tzaddik. He was an outstanding tzaddik. He wasn't born like that. He became Moshe Rabbeinu. In fact, there's, a, there's an amazing midrash that says that in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, there was a king who knew what's called chokhmat apartsuf. He knew by looking at the face of an individual to tell the attributes of the person. The Zohar goes into this a lot in Yitro. Uh, you can tell by the lines on the forehead, the color of the eyes, the shape of the nose, the eyebrows, the cheeks, how the face is formed. The Zohar goes into this, believe it or not, how you can tell a person who they are and their attributes. And there was a king in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu that he knew what's called Chokhmat Apartzuf, the soul, the secret of knowing a person by their face. And he very much, once Moshe Rabbeinu became famous, he wanted very much to get a portrait of Moshe Rabbeinu. So he sent one of his students, who also knew how to make a sculpture and an image, whatever, imagery, it was an art, artistic, take a look at Moshe Rabbeinu's face, bring me his portrait, I want to see his face. So he brought the image of Moshe Rabbeinu, and the king says, this cannot be him, this is not him. It can't be him. He said, what do you mean? This is him. I saw him. I, I, I looked very carefully at his face and I made a copy of what I saw. He says, it can't be. This is the face of a robber, a thief, a murderer. What did, what did you give me here? What did you send me here? So word got out to Moshe Rabbeinu about the story of the king. And he said, he's right. I was born really with how my characteristics as at birth, I was born with these negative tendencies and I worked on myself to such a high degree that I totally destroyed all these bad attributes within me. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't born Moshe Rabbeinu. Rabbi Nachman once taught, people who think tzaddikim are born tzaddikim, they're wrong. You know, people think they're born on top of the mountain. If the father was a big rabbi, so automatically the son is a rabbi because he grew up in the house of such tzaddikim, he must be also at a big level. Rabbi Nachman says that's a big error that people make. They think, ah, of course you're a tzaddik. You're a descendant of the Baal Shem Tov. You're a descendant of Baba Sali. You're this. Of course you're a big tzaddik. He said, that's wrong. The tzaddikim, they worked for it. They killed themselves to, to, to be, they're not, they're, not, they're not looking for the title. They killed themselves to come close to Hashem. And it happened, by the way, they became tzaddikim. But they, were, they worked for it. And Moshe Rabbeinu said that I, 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 all these attributes were in me. Yes, a murderer based on my face, on who I am, where we're supposed to be, all these things was how I was supposed to be when I worked on myself. And he would reach such a high level. So never we couldn't judge him on his face anymore. Because that's how he was supposed to be. But he worked on himself. So Moshe Rabbeinu worked at this level to become what's called Rabban Shev Kona Nevi'i, the, the teacher, the rabbi, the rabbi of all the future prophets. Basically, the greatest tzaddik in history, believe it or not, was to be Moshe Rabbeinu. He, he earned the title. He is equal to 600,000 Jews. Rashi brings it down in the Torah also, that the Rosh is considered the whole thing. The whole nation is the, is, the, is the leader. So with that in mind, and sorry, just to go maybe a step further to explain how the Arizal explains the makeup and the setup of the Jewish souls, how the Jewish souls are set up in heaven. In other words, how, how, how is it portrayed? How does it look, the makeup of Jewish souls? Is it one on top of the next? Is it one next to each other? How does it work in heaven? So it's like the imagery of a tree. In a tree you have the bark, the main stem, and from the main stem is coming the major branches. From the major branches come smaller branches, and then smaller and smaller and smaller, to have all the leaves. So too by the Jewish nation you have what's called the Tzadik Yisod Olam, the root soul of all of Israel, which is, the Arizal explains, is the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu, that's like the trunk of the tree. From his soul is emanating, connecting all the other souls of Am Yisrael, the major tzaddikim after that, the 70 elders, Aaron, Chor, and then you have other rabbanim and tzaddikim and this, until you came to all the Jewish nation as a, as a whole. They're all rooted like a tree, like the leaves and everything. That's the, that's the, the, por the, the, the portrait, how it's given the imagery of the, se the setup of the Jewish souls. So in, in the picture you have that the root of the tree, which is the main part of the tree, is one, and that's the idea of the neshama of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's how the setup is. So now, to go back to what we said, an individual, how can he make himself a tzibur, make himself 
even though he's an individual in himself. All alone, he's an individual. How can he transform his davening to become, even though he's an individual, to make it a tzibor? So this is the concept, which is a very, in a way, controversy concept that people are not used to hearing, but it's brought down in the Torah, the concept that a person has to find a tzaddik, has to attach oneself to a tzaddik, and the wording of the Chazal, it's lidabek b'talmidei chachamim, to attach oneself to Torah scholars. That's the wording in Ethics of Our Fathers. Pirkei Avot, one has to lidabek, to attach oneself to the, to the Torah scholars. What does that benefit mean? Let me brush it off of me. By this attachment, which means a few things. Number one, that I don't have the attitude, it's just me and Hashem and Torah books from the past. I have my Gemara, I have my Mishnah, and I can manage on my own. No. I'm looking for guidance. Every generation has new circumstances and situations which are the category of the oral Torah and I need guidelines on how to serve Hashem with these new circumstances. So Hashem spread out in every generation. There are tzaddikim. Why do I need this tzaddikim? Let me just dove and go to shul. I have Hashem. I have my prayers. I know Hashem listens to me. I have my Torah classes. That's it. Why do I need tzaddikim today? Because I'm faced with daily trials and tribulations which didn't exist 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago. Then they had other tests. But today, modern day, society has newer tests and situations and scenarios. The internet and this and buses and technology. I need to know how to manage to, uh, uh, on the water which is trying to drown me, how to raise my head to be able to breathe and to come out of being drowned by the temptations and difficulties in, in the modern day society generation. For that, Hashem sent every generation tzaddikim. And they offer what's called advice. They offer kedusha. They offer like a lifesaver to help a person who's drowning to hold on, to give them that connection, to give them the insights in the Torah, how to reconnect to Hashem. They have the Torah, but it became dry. I don't see myself and Hashem together anymore. What to do? So the tzaddikim who have x-ray vision, they're able to probe deeper and to give you that boost of the Torah that you already know, but you need a new dimension in the depth of the Torah to wake you up, the tzaddikim have the ability to do that, giving you the wake-up call, and that's the main thing that tzaddikim offer. Also, if they're able to do that, then they're holy people. They're holy, they're holy people at a high level, and it's worthwhile being in their proximity, being in their closeness, because they can rub off on me. There's a rule in the Mishnah, in the laws of purity and impurity. If you have one item which is pure, and you have a second secondary item which is impure, so the Mishnah brings a rule, Hadavuk la tahor, tahor. An item which is attached, it's like in the laws, in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, if there was like a dead corpse in a house, and there were, there were, there, there's, a, there's a question, if there's a, there's a piece of wood sticking out of the house, is it connected, not connected, or it's in, it's in a different domain, and the idea of, of, of looking to a secondary item in, in, in light, in vain, of, the, of a primary item. So it's like this, that anything which is attached to a, a pure item, even if the item in itself is impure, the fact that it's in close proximity to a pure item, an item which is impure, which is attached to a pure item, which is a bigger, bigger quality, bigger volume, it becomes also, becomes rendered pure. Even though in itself, the item is impure, by being attached to a pure item, it becomes pure. Even though he's impure, but it's being connected. The davuk la tahor, tahor. So to a person in himself, could be an individual, and he's stuck, he's in a major, major crash, major dead-end situation. How could he get out? By transforming a situation. How could he do that? Connecting to tzaddikim. Attachment to tzaddikim, which is not, in other words for emunat chachamim, faith in the sages, learning their teachings, not just the Torah that's been until now, but also learning the Torah insights of the present day tzaddikim, to give you that boost, that brings this the energy, this light, to give this new dimension that I'm no longer alone. I'm no longer a yachid, an individual. I'm now a tzibur, because the tzaddikim, like Moshe Rabbeinu, are an all-encompassing soul. So Moshe Rabbeinu is not just one soul. Like Rabbi Akiva said, he's 600,000 souls. So I, alone, I'm alone. But if I'm connected to tzaddikim, so it's like this term that exists in the Gemara, nanas al gabe anak, a midget who's standing on top of a giant. The midget on, all alone is a midget. But if you put him on top of the giant, he's taller than everybody. 
He's, he's above the whole crowd. He got a higher level. So that's, that's, a, that's like a, 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 the Torah gives a, a green card, protects in Hebrew, in Hebrew. We have all types of bypasses to, to, to there's a normal way, a procedure to do things. It doesn't work out black and white, fine, you're finished. But Hashem in His compassion gives in the Torah these secret bypasses that you can do all types of tricks on, on a good sense, on a positive sense, for someone who really wants to come back to Hashem. There's all types of these tricks in the Torah itself to help a person to come back. He can bypass and, and, and have things work out in the end with Hashem, even though logically, rationally, there was no hope for him. He was finished. Even in heaven, they decreed against him. So this the idea of a tzibur, a tzibur which is the, the soul of the tzaddikim. And now with this, we enter the new idea that a tzaddik is called a shaliach tzibur. On a, on a deeper level now. A tzaddik is called a shalech tzibur. What's a shalech tzibur? When you have a, a quorum, a minyan, so you have someone, one of the ten, who goes up to Daven as a chazan. He's called a chazan, but he's also called a shaliach. He's the messenger of the tzibur. But there's a greater depth in the concept of a shaliach tzibur. He's the messenger of what's called the tzibur. What is the tzibur? Tzibur translates as a community. But the... the the, the Shulchan Aruch, the Gemara, the Mishnah teaches that the word Sibur is made up of three words. Besides the, the vowels, you have Tzadik, Bet, Resh. We pronounce it Sibur. We add a Yud, a dot, a Chirik under the Tzadik, and we add a Vav after the Bet. But the three root letters of the word of Sibur is Tzadik, Bet, Resh, which stands for what? This is something known Tzadikim, Benonim, Reshaim. A minion, a community is made up of tzaddikim, righteous people, people in between, and wicked people. And what's the teaching? That in order for prayers to be answered, you have to have in your quorum all types of people, from the greatest people to the lowest people. If it's just a minion of tzaddikim, so Hashem is not so comfortable with it. The prayers are answered, but complete a tzibur, a real tzibur, is where you have all types of Jews together. You have the greatest ones, the in-between people, and the wicked coming together to daven, for, for Hashem, that's the greatest type of prayer, that's the greatest type of tzibur. Again, you can have a minion of just wicked people, or just in-between people, or just tzaddikim, they're davening. Fine, the Hashem will answer the prayer. We said a, a, a quorum is always answered, a minion, a group, is always answered. But the complete aspect is when you have the prayers of even the wicked joining in. Now to go on a deeper level, the idea of a, of a tzaddik, being called a shaliach tzibur is, is a messenger to help a person come out of his situation. In other words, tzibur is a transition. We want to help a person get out from being a rasha, elevate him to become what's called a benoni, and then finally elevate him to become a tzaddik, tzibur. A tzaddik is called shaliach tzibur in that he's working constantly to elevate the Jewish people to find in them what's called good points, merits, and that, in that merit they're not such a bad person after all, and by focusing on the good, lifting them up. This is one of the most important teachings of the Rabbi Nachman. It's called the lesson Azamra. It's the lesson, the idea of finding the good in yourself, and automatically, once you do that, you can find the good in other people. Because normally people who look at other people negatively is because they're negative with themselves. They have a hard time with themselves. Tzaddikim, they try to help to be there from Israel to help people find their good points. This is so fundamental in life because the main reason why people have failures or don't, so, so to speak, succeed in fulfilling what they were sent down to this world to do and becoming who they really were is because of the feelings of failure and depression and dejection that attack the majority of people. To explain, when we look back at life, <clears throat> we see teenagehood, youthhood, ch children and young people, they have high aspirations because they did not yet go through life. So everything is so positive, I'm going to conquer the world, I'm going to become this. Even in holiness, that people are, I'm going to become the biggest Rosh Hashiva, I'm going to become a super duper governor, I'm going to invest, I'm going to become. Even in, in holiness, especially in holiness, when a person wants to come back to Hashem, in the beginning, there's a lot of a positive light because the person has not yet passed through the difficulties. He's just beginning, hasn't started yet the war of life, it's called, right? 
after you look 10 years down the line, after being punched left and right, difficulties, obstacles, achzavot, failures, sad, sad situations, all types of things, heartbreaking situations, so that those situations tend to, to rub off on the person's energetic attitude that he had at the beginning. Because it's no longer that it's just that live energy and that's it, but there's now a counter force of situations to pull down that energy. Rabbi Nachman teaches you can, if you want to, maintain, even after going through everything you've gone through in life, maintain an energy connected to the beginning. It sounds like a dream, but come on. After what I've gone through in life, you want me to have that feeling of that energy like the beginning, but look what I went through in life, look what I'm going through, look all the achzavot, all the heartbreaks, all the failures, all the difficulties. How do you expect me to be above it and to have such a strong, like, soldier attitude in my davening, in my service of Hashem, in my optimism in life after what I've gone through? So he teaches you can. How? By focusing on your good. Because the, the reason why people fall and drop everything off from it even is because they're looking at the bad. Because the bad makes such a presence in one's life. Look, everything's a failure. Your marriage is a failure. Your children are a failure. Your health is a failure. Just drop it already. Stop trying. The Yitzhar is always making a person to look at the bad. And it's strong. His attack is strong. What, it, what you don't realize is that there's so many other good things in life that you're not looking at because the bad is trying to make you look at the, the Yitzhar is trying to make you look only at the bad. And this is very real. This is something that every human being comes across in their life. Is that the negative has, it takes its toll on you. It takes a toll on a person. It weakens their aspiration, their, their yearning, their desire. Because it makes such a presence. Rabbona Shalom, what do you want from me? Look what I'm going through in life. So this, Rabbi Nachman teaches, is look at the good. Look at the good. I can't though, it's not working out. That's the idea of a tzaddik being called a shaliach tzibur. The tzaddikim are there to help you look at your good points. The Yitzhah is so cunning, he's so tricking. Why? Life is a, a big rainbow. There's so much colors in life. Some, one area of life goes sour. So what the Yitzhah does, he makes you just look at that area. And you have another 5,000 other good things in life to be happy about, to be proud about, to be energetic about, but no, he focuses on point number one of the 5,000, let's say, the rainbow. The point number one, point 26, point 38, point 142. <laughs> Look, it's, it's very bad, and it makes it everything dark. One second, did you open your eyes to see 143, 144, one, everything is beautiful there. And then from 27, 28, you're not, you, he does such a good job in making a person, that's it, my life is finished. Why? Because I'm looking at the dark. All I see is dark. The tzaddikim said, open your eyes, look for the good point. On your own, it's difficult, it's hard, yes, it's hard. So the tzaddikim are here to open your eyes, to see the good in yourself. To see your, that's why it's called the shaliach tzibur. His job is to elevate you from the rasha. I see only bad, I see the negative. To push you slowly to benoni. Okay, it's not that bad, I see, besides the... The negative 26, the negative 142, I'm beginning to see also 158, 149, 2004. I'm beginning to see more good points <laughs> until you can see Tzaddik. I'm okay. I'm not that bad. Come on. Yet, Sarah, you make it you're finished. You're such your you're mamash, the worst person in the world. You're the Chasa Shalom given Gainam is not enough for you. You're mamash, you did the worst things and this and that. Oh, really? And all my other good points? No, they have no value. He tells a person they count to nothing. They have no value whatsoever. Look, after what you did, you think your good points, you think your tefillin makes a difference? And the answer is yes. Why does he convince you that it doesn't make a difference? Because he keeps on pushing you. No, look here, look here. But I want to look here. No, no, no. Look at the bad. It's only bad, only bad. We always see is the bad. So this is the Yitzhara's trick. His trick. I need a shaliach tzibur. I need a tzaddik who's able to bring out from the rasha within me to find the good points. And it's not as bad as the Yitzhah is being, he's, he's working on convincing me that it is. This is the main gift of coming close to the tzaddikim, is that they open a person's eyes <clears throat> to see the true reality of life. For example, life in itself. How do people view their life? 
the, 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 the whole world, in other words, the Gentile nations, they view their life only from birth and to death, and that's it. So based on that, everything seems to be not ne very negative. There's, there's a lot of what, a misery in life to look at because it starts at birth, ends at death, and all the success rate is based on that limitation. But we as Jews, we know that the birth and death is just part of the whole picture. In this world, because of this, the, the concealment of the world, through emuna, we understand, we believe, that there's much more out there in the whole picture. Just that in, in the limitation we have, we see from the day of birth and the day of death, and we can see things based on that. But through emuna, as a Jew, we know that this is just part of the picture. It's one millionth of the entire picture of all the worlds, of how what the repercussion of every tiny mitzvah you do, you don't see it. Only in the world to come, we see what every tiny tzedakah did, every tefillin did, every Shabbat, every Kiddush, every pe eating matzah, Pesach, every Yom Kippur, every smile, every bikr cholim. You don't see anything in this world. Nothing, nothing. And in the, in, in the, in the, in the future, B'zat Hashem, we get a clear, clear picture of the bigger piece. And we begin to say, if only I would have known. <laughs> I wouldn't have wasted my time. I would have done much more. And I, much more than I actually did. I could have accomplished much more and run much more and invested much more and be happier because I see that in, in light of the big picture, everything is beautiful, everything is good. That's one thing. Another thing is that a person is so successful in being positive, he can mamash transform the evil, mitigate it to make it into good. I'm going back to the Gemara, that a person's mm -hmm. decree, it's already sealed, Right? It's finished. What does it mean that Hashem can answer a prayer, that I can try some more, that Hashem answer my prayer? That those situations which were dead end, all of a sudden there's an opening in life. There's an opening. That's what davening means. That davening, Hashem answers your prayers. In other words, is that miracles can happen. Yes, dead end situations that I'm working and for this to work, it didn't work out. If I don't give up, number one, and I take, maintain a positive attitude in life, and I focus on the good and not on the bad. By focus and uh, when in the situation where the bad is trying to bring me down, so then I can transform that bad into becoming good. Also, it becomes a tzaddik gemur. Person can be elevated to become a tzaddik gemur. This is basically the teaching, the idea of uh, of, of, uh, of the para aduma. Also, the para aduma to go to the next, the next, the next level. There was something very unique about the red eifer. The what? That the, 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 the purpose of the ashes of the red eifer were to make pure somebody who was impure. And what's funny in the Torah, it says, we read on Shabbat, that all the Kohanim who were involved in preparing the ashes of the red eifer, they became impure. That's funny, they're two opposites. It makes pure the impure, but the people who prepared it, it made those who were pure already impure. So Rav Nassim explains something beautiful in the Kut He says that the idea of the para aduma and the ashes and everything is that this is the concept, he says, of finding the good points. That even when we burn the, the para, we make it into ashes. That even when I see only dark, there must be a good point. There must be something good hiding here in my life that I have to un unravel, un uncover and to discover and to find. So this is the idea of the ashes of the red life. But there's a trick here. When a person, when does this apply to a person to find the good points? When he's really in darkness. When a person's on a real, real low, then we apply to the person to find the good. Because he's in danger now. Like the person, the, the four have to give thanks to Hashem. They're in danger, they have to cry to Hashem. You're in danger now. So a danger means that I'm under a lot of judgments, a lot of constrictions, and it's a dark situation. I need this thing of finding the good. So this is the idea that the red heifer had the ability to make pure those who are impure, those who are trapped in impurity, and they see only the negative, they see the wickedness, to make them pure, that's the idea of finding the good points, finding the good within the ashes of the red heifer. But it's a danger. Someone now who's up there, he's, he's besimcha and everything's good, to use this attitude of finding the good when he's up there could be dangerous. Because he's already having a high now, he's already up now, and things are going good. He's an attitude of giving thanks to Hashem. Such a person now, who tries to find the good points, that's dangerous now. Because he's already up there, 
Finding too much good will lead him to haughtiness and push him too high, and that will crush him. So it can make pure, impure those who are pure already. He's already pure. He's already in the light, in the Kedusha. He feels good about himself. He's a positive. So this teaching of Azamra, finding the good points, could be dangerous for him at this point. In other words, in life, there's a fluctuation. There's a time where you have to focus on the bad. Like we do vidu, confession. Hashem, I sinned, I did these terrible things and everything. There's a time to do confession, and there's a time when you have to find the good in yourself. You have to know the gear shifts. There's two situations in life, in every day even. There's situations where I have to confront my difficulties, I have to regret, I have to feel the pain of what I went through and to express it in confession, to do vidui, to, 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 to admit and regret what I did, the negative things. But when a person's already down, and you tell him to do that, he's, he's going to crash. There's going to be nothing left of him. So such a person has to be boosted with the attitude of finding the good. The majority of the people, the majority of the day, they're in this scenario where they need a big boost of encouragement, of light, of finding the good. So, it, But is it, there's this balance you need. We have to know when to apply this and that. But in the main, this teaching of Azamra, of finding the good points, is what's mainly needed, and this is the mission of the tzaddikim. They call the shaliach tzibur to bring a person from Russia to Benoni to tzaddik until every Jew becomes a tzaddik. And the verse says clearly, "Va'amech kulam tzaddikim." Your whole nation, they're all tzaddikim. Every Jew has a tzaddik point. Even if you see a complete sinner, it can't be that he's a complete sinner. How could it be? You see what's called a rasha gamur. How could I see as someone who's a complete sinner? In my eyes, it appears to be a complete sinner. And Rabbi Nachman teaches, even in a Rasha Gamur, a complete sinner, you have to find a good point. How could it be? Because if you see someone as being a complete sinner, you have, your eyes have the problem. Your, your, your lens is not strong enough on your prescription. You need a better prescription to, to look in to find that he has a good point. By finding the good point in him, you can actually help that person to come back. We'll develop this visit to Shem next week, but maybe we zochah visit to Shem to use this pathway now that Pesach is here. And Pesach is like a, a breath of fresh air. It's a new beginning. It's after coming out of this so-called Egypt of the winter months, Shovavim, that we went through, where a person, on a personal level, he feels very negative, very, there's a lot of feelings of, uh, of um, futility, of, of feelings that that's, I'm just finished, chas shalom, and Pesach is a time when people just come out who they really are, and it's our job to carry this light of Pesach to the whole year, Bezat Hashem. That, that there's good, and when things get very difficult, stop, look for the good, to find the good points, I'm okay, everything's beautiful, life is good, uh, but Yetzirah is attacking, no, 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 everything is good, there's beautiful things, I'm not going to be convinced, I need now desperately to find the light, to find the good points in me in order to survive, in order to make it, in order to continue going. It's not a time to be negative. And Pesach is that time of Geula, of redemption for the good, and we should carry it on to the whole year of Hashem. So it's a situation where you're, you're, you're not there. Your head is not there. We, we, we spoke about it also last week, two weeks ago. Of of the, of, it's an idea, yeah. It's, uh, that, uh, okay, in chapter 107, the, according to Halacha, Halacha learns out from chapter 107 in Psalms, four people according to Halacha who have to give thanks. That means, if we had now the temple standing, these four types of people are obligated to give a thanksgiving offering. Today, we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. So these four types of people have to do what's called Birkat HaGomel. They, again, a, a, a woman, for example, who just gave birth, where it's Mama Shisakana, so after she comes out of the hospital and she's able to stand on her feet, we bring a, man, a core of a minion of men, and she says the Birkat HaGomer. We thank Hashem, who did for people who don't deserve it, kindnesses. And then the people say, Amen, just like Hashem did kindnesses for you, may continue to do kindnesses and goodnesses to you. So the four types of people include someone who travels by air, someone who flies from New York to, to Eretz Israel. He has to do Birkat HaGomer because he traveled over the sea, technically. But Moshe Feinstein explains, you know the dangers in a plane like you do in a ship, in the, in the ship in the sea. It's not much scary, back then at least, you know, 500 years ago, 200 years ago. So what, what, what's the danger? So he said, Moshe Feinstein, something amazing. Because of the complications of the circuitry of an airplane, for all the 500 buttons that are there, if God forbid one button doesn't work by the, you know, by the captain, by the, the captain, you know, it can be very dangerous, we don't realize it. 
There's mama, oh, he says there's tons of miracles, and you know, we take it for granted because I have my nice, comfortable first class chair. You know, it's comfortable, it's very cozy with the pillow and everything, and they give me the, the glass wine bottle, and I'm okay, I don't see anything, nothing's wrong, right? But really, really, a person's with Sakana, he doesn't realize it, but it's a mamash of danger, and, and just the fact that he's traveling already over seas or over a desert, he has to say what's called Birkata Goma, going into the air. The, the air uh, atmosphere already has to give him the Birkata Gomel attitude, and that's why he's obligated to say Birkata Gomel. So, also, a person who travels in a desert, a person who comes out of jail, for if there's a minimum of time that he's in jail, he comes out, he has to say Birkata Gomel. That's the halachic ramification. But all the commentaries in the Gemara explain that there's a deeper ramification on a personal level. And this Rabbi Nachman also stressed that you have four types of situations in life. You have in your life a desert, you have in your life a jail, you have in your life of being sick, God forbid, you have in life a person who's in, in, in storm. You have situations, a desert like you have no one to turn to, you don't know where you're going in life, you have no idea what to do, you have doubts. So it's like a person in desert, I don't, I'm a nomad, I'm just wandering, I have no idea what direction, direction to take in life. So that's a situation, a situation of a desert, a person who's in jail, who you know what to do, but there's obstacles. They don't let me do from heaven what I want to do. All things are popping up to prevent me from becoming and doing what I want to do. I know what to do already. It's like in jail. And a person who is sick is that he's being eaten up by such thoughts of futility, depression. He doesn't want to do anything. He just wants to sit in the corner and he's just, I'm fed up. I can't do anything anymore. That's a sickness. And in the last case, a person is hit with like a mamash, a tragedy, like a, a shock, a, a, a traumatic situation where you can't count on the person to be there. He's being like, oh my God, what's happening to me? I, 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 I'm not in control. It's not mind over matter. So that's a situation of the sea storm. That's the idea, that the storm knocks a person out totally. And in that situation, you need what's called the light of this tzaddikim, just the idea of the noon. I, I didn't explain this point. I should have explained it. The noon backwards, the noon, the, 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 the pshat is, noon backwards means that that there's an exception to the rule, and it's in this case of the, the guy in the sea, that always a person who cries out of that situation, he's like an individual. So now what to do, we said, is to look for the tzaddiki. Make yourself into a tzibur. You're no longer an individual, you're a tzibur. This is also, I forgot to mention, hinted in the letter Nun. What is the letter Nun? 50. In the Chumash, when it says 50, it says go back 50 chapters, that's where Vahi bin Saaron, like we said in the, earlier in the class, is supposed to be. By Tehillim, the rabbis didn't say that in the Gemara, to go 50 chapters in, in Tehillim earlier. Go from chapter 107 to minus 50. They didn't say that. So it's left open to explain what's the idea of number the letter Nun backwards. The letter Nun, we said, signifies 50. What's the number 50 in Judaism? 50 is the maximum level of holiness. Who reached that level? Moshe Rabbeinu. When? When did Moshe Rabbeinu reach level 50 of holiness? When he passed away. Well, that's why it says he was buried in Har Nevo. Har Nevo, the Midrash explains, the Zohar explains, Nun Bo. He attained the level of 50, Moshe Rabbeinu, in his passing. When he was buried in Har Nevo, Nun 50, Nun Bo, in it. He got to the level 50 at, at his passing, which means that now, after the Moshe Rabbeinu has actually passed away, all subsequent tzaddikim of every generation, they're connected to Moshe Rabbeinu's light at level 50. It says, for example, in the Midrash, that Mordechai was the representative of Moshe Rabbeinu in that generation, in the story of Esther and Torah and Shusha and everything. He was Mamash, the Midrash says this clearly, he was just, if you want to call it the reincarnation or the actual essence of Moshe Rabbeinu and the generation of the story of Purim and Haman. Which aspect of Moshe Rabbeinu? After his passing. Meaning, the level 50 that Moshe Rabbeinu reached in his passing, that was the light of Mordechai. So to go back, in the Psalm 107, when the noon is backwards, it's indicating to the person, you know why you're in danger, you know why your prayer is not being answered, because you're turned away from the noon, which is the tzaddik. Noon is number 50, the tzaddik, Moshe Rabbeinu, at his passing. By you, the noon is backwards, you're an individual what to do, turn the noon back to you. How to do that? Find the tzaddikim. Connect to them, you are no longer a yachid, you are a tzibur. You become a tzibur. That's indicated in the letter noon being turned. We can go into more about why, why there are six noons, 
and uh, what's the number six? But uh, <laughs> Adkan, <laughs> stop here. <laughs> another another hour or two hours, whatever. <laughs> All right. So I hope that answered the question. This is the, the symbolism, and I thank you for bringing it up because this point of the noon I forgot to mention. This is a very important point. The dafka the noon is the indication of that you're alone because the noon is turned away from you. Connect to the noon, which is the idea of the tzaddikim. Moshe Rabbeinu in his passing, level fifty. Next question. Right. Sorry about this, but uh, I was trying, but um, I just couldn't get it. Yeah. That, that if you get up that high, then all of a sudden it's negative. I just didn't understand. Ah, the, and then part of the para, the red eye for right. Yeah. You have people who Hashem is so good to them, and they're having an experience of light. If they utilize this teaching of finding the good points, it'll be too dangerous for them, too bad. It will be, what, 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 I understand your question, I'll explain. Because what's called Vibu or Gorem Choshech, for example, I'll explain. If too much oil is going into a candle, you have a candle of flame burning, if there's too much oil going into the, the wick, it's going to extinguish the flame. The flame will not successfully burn. Meaning what? When a person has an excess, even in holiness, in Kedusha, Excess is never good. Everything has to be in proper balance. That's how this world is designed. That there's a light and there's a darkness. Every day has day, night. Day, night. Everything in life is an experience and then you come out of the experience. Like a person is preparing for their journey to go, to, I'm, I'm taking a vacation there to Israel. He goes, he takes all the pictures. Wow, it was a beautiful experience. And then he goes back to work. He goes back to day to day life and going back to the family and, and the home and everything. All of life is designed like that. There's in and then coming out. It's not con con consistently being in a level of Kedusha. You have to have in and out, that's how it is. In order that there shouldn't be what's called a shvira, a shattering of the vessels, this is the, the term in the Kabbalah. On your personal level, you should have a shattering. Everything should be done in proper balance. Even in holiness, you go high, don't go too high. Because if you go too high, you're gonna crash. And also you go too high, the extreme light is gonna make you just disappear. The example of the Torah that they give of this are the two sons of Aaron, Adav and David. They were both holy tzaddikim. The problem was they had no boundaries. They wanted to go all the way. They went in, offered uh, incense sacrifice where they were commanded. They wanted to go past their boundary. In the end, they died. They died as tzaddikim. They didn't die as sinners. The Torah says, Moshe Benu says, that be Krovai Kadesh, in my holy ones I will be sanctified. That they were holy, they were considered holy tzaddikim. The thing was, they went too far, they, they, they went too far. They, they couldn't, they didn't have the force of constriction to know when to stop. Because in Judaism and life, it's like that. In both, in darkness and in light. You have to know where to put the brakes in darkness, and also where to put the brakes in light. Too much light is dangerous. One shouldn't think, Okay, it's a beautiful Jewish spiritual experience. Let's go all the way. You're risking it. It's a danger. It's a, it's a trap. When you go all the way, you're risking to lose it. Be careful. You, you, Sachakol, what are you? You're a human being. You're a physical limitation, a human being. Your soul is infinite, but it's been put in this capsule called the body, which is, has limitations. You have a limitation on the fingers, on the skin. There's a limit to how, how far you exist. Your soul is super duper endless in its power, but it's constricted. So meaning, everything I do in my life so far in this physical existence has to be done with caution. Even in holiness, even in the good. So going back, this teaching of finding the good applies specifically to when a person is going through the down and the difficulty. It needs, that's what needs to be activated. To have the merit to activate this teaching of finding the good it's a big schut to remember it at the time when a person is down that he knows there's this concept of finding the good points to get back up and to continue going until <coughs> you it again in life to find the good and <coughs> push the person to keep on going as a question. Yes, question. Yeah, I saw a question. Okay. I'm stuck. Okay. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I, I think, I know what it, what it is when it's uh, 
up to looking at the good points inside of you, but I think for the good points in the world, I think this is a avodah that you should do every day. Wherever high or low you are, you should always try to look at the always the good outside of you and in uh, in other people also to be happy. Because if you don't do that, then you can't keep up with the happiness. Right. And this, how high you are, you should always look at the good around you. The, mm -hmm. and, and, and if you want to receive more light also, like you were saying, I think there's a way to do it. You need to build yourself a strong kelly. As strong as you build yourself with like habits, mitzvot, like that you do every day with strong habits, then you can receive more light. But to receive more light, you need to be stronger with stronger habits. Then right, you can right. receive more. But mm -hmm. you can still. I have to elaborate on this. The Pirkei says clearly, Hevidan et kol adam You have to always judge other people favorably. Okay? <laughs> always. When it comes to other people, I have to give him the benefit of the doubt. The Gemara brings an amazing story people know about or don't know about it. There was a man from the Upper Galilee. He came down to the south of Eretz Yisrael and he, hired him, he needed money. So he hired himself out to work for, as a farmer for a Jew. And at the end of the term of the, way, of the, of the, of the work, he came to ask, he says, give me my wages and go back home so I can have money to bring home. So his boss said, I have no money to give you. So he said, maybe give me some animals instead. I have no animals to give you. Maybe you have some fruits and fruits and vegetables to give you. I have nothing to give you. Maybe you have some pillows and blankets that I can take. I have nothing to give you. Broken, he went back. Up, 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 up north. A few weeks passed. He sees coming to him in the upper building in his home. The boss, that the, the early, three weeks earlier, he said, I have nothing to give you, came with tons of donkeys, with tons of fruits and vegetables and clothing and, and materials and animals as a gift and money to pay him. And he, the man invited him in, they ate together, and he said, okay, you know, I said, first of all, here's your wages, number one. And I want to ask you, when I, when I told you I have no money, what did you think? So I said, I assume that maybe you, at that moment there was like a big business opportunity and you took all your money, invested all your money in that opportunity, invested in that, and you had no ready cash to give me. <laughs> and he said, and when I, when I told you I have no, no animals to give you cattle and, and, and sheep to give you, what did you think? I said, I thought now that you possibly uh, had tied, the, what would it say again, the Gemara? I'm trying to remember, one second. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that you had lent out all your animals to some other farmers, you had no animals to give me to, that I, I had no, you had no animals to give me for instead. And when I, when, I, when I told you I had no fruits and, vet and, and uh, produce of the earth to give to you, what did you think? I said, Pro possibly you didn't yet take off the ma'asir, take off the tithing from the fruits of the land and the vegetables, and therefore everything was tevel and you couldn't give me anything. And when I told you I had no pillows and blankets, what did you think? He said, Pro I, 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 uh, I thought maybe you, may you vowed, you made a nether, the type of an oath, that to, 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 to deny any personal hana'ah, benefit from all of my, your items, including my, my blankets and towels. That's what I thought. And he said, by God, that's exactly what happened. In every situation, and especially the last one, I, I, in order that my son, Horkonos, should not learn Torah, I made, I made a nether, I, I, I made a nidu that I have no more connection to my property, so he, so he shouldn't gain from it, because he's not learning Torah. I don't want him to gain from it. And afterwards, I went to the Chachamim, and they found a heter, an opening, to, to break my nether, so yes, I, now I can have access again, because I regretted doing that, I was out of anger that my son is not learning Torah, so I made, him, I made a nether and he that he can't touch anything on my property, and also it's, it's, it's restricted from me, and there, I, gave it, I gave it away in other words. And I, I went to the rabbis afterwards to, to break my nether. It's exactly as you <laughs> said, and just as you judge me favorably, so too may, may others judge you favorably. That's the Gemara's example that they give of, 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 of Adan the Kafshut. When it comes to other people, you have to be always done the kaf schut, okay? But yourself now, like we said, there are times in life where you have to do what's called a cheshbon nefesh. You have to, you can't just say everything's okay and everything and your life is, and, and you're not taking care of areas in life. You have to improve. So there's this, again, we said there's this balance. There is, like they say in the rest of them, a joke. One hour a day, Yom Kippur, and 23 hours a day, pouring. One hour is Yom Kippur, which is the confession and crying out to Hashem, my sin, and this and that. And 23 hours is pouring, happy. And the good points, you got that? And you can only truly be happy in the 23 hours 
if you do the one hour of what's called Yom Kippur, of, of confessing and opening up your heart to Hashem properly, but to go all day long with a negative attitude, oh, Hashem, I'm so far from you, I'm such a sinner, and that, and to carry it on, the danger is that Chas a person can easily fall into depression, and then he's going to need only to find the good points in order to get back out again. But there's this balance. There's this balance of the time of confession and crying out to Hashem, crying over the sins, crying over the negative, and then there's the, there's the majority of the day which is being positive. For the majority of people in the world, it's very difficult. And the, the goal is to find that, that balance, to know when to cry, when to have the brokenheartedness, when to regret, to feel bad about the sins, in order to do tshuva, and also when is the time to be positive. And the Baal Davar, he wants to ruin, he wants to switch it. At the time when you reserved to cry to Hashem, oh, I don't feel anything. I want to open my heart, and I just I'm being distracted by thinking about the stock, the stocks rising today, and the the the, the 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 World Cup, and all these things coming up in my head to distract me. And now's the time I want to do the the, the brokenheartedness. And then when it comes to being happy, all these things attack now. Look what happened, and terrible disasters and everything. He switches things. Our goal is to have the one hour that should be mamash, a one hour of intense brokenheartedness, and the rest of the day should be positive. That's the goal to do that. Yes. So um, I was uh, recontacted by someone who was in graduate school with, um, and it turns out um, he's very negative towards Israel. Israel is immoral, and uh, PLO bent and so forth. I'm not positive to this person. When we said that even a complete sinner, you have to find the good, we're talking about your fellow kinsmen, we're talking about Jewish people. This person well, he, isn't Jewish. Isn't Jewish. We're talking about Jewish people. Call, there's what's called it Poshea Israel, a Jewish sinner. What's special about a Jewish sinner? That even though he's a sinner, he's called he's still called a Jew. He's a Jewish sinner. What does that mean? He's a sinner, yes, he's terrible, he did terrible things, the mafia and everything, but he's still Jewish. What does it mean that he's still Jewish? That you have your mission is to seek into him some good which is hiding. We're going to develop this visit Hashem, I hope, next week, visit Hashem. But the good, by you finding and un unraveling and uncovering His good, you can mamash help Him to do tshuva and to come back. He appears to be a complete sinner. When you see a Rasha Gamur, he's a complete sinner. Him, I could never forgive. This person is going to the dogs, he's going to burn in hell and everything, but he's Jewish. He's a Jewish sinner, but he's Jewish. What does that mean? In your eyes, he's a complete sinner. I have to find the good. There's a good which is connected to his Jewishness, his essence. It's called a Jewish sinner, meaning there's something good inside of him. And that's our mission. Rav Nassim once said, even if I hear the worst things coming out of the mouth of any Jew, I know still and believe that deep down inside, he still wants to be a good Jew. He can say the worst things possible against Hashem, against the Torah, against our beliefs, against our faith, but still deep down inside there's some good point. It's called the Pintaliyid. It's a drop of Yiddishkeit which can never be erased. Our mission is to find in others that good point. To do that, again, it starts by me finding my good points. To know when I have my optimism within myself, then I can find the good in other people. And by finding the good in other people, I can mamash help them to do tshuva. That's the key to bringing them back. It's unbelievable. You can help them 